I remember walking into the Channel 9 newsroom. Now, Channel 9 then, uh, this is 89, I think, was, you know, the number one network. It was th the guys who'd made it to Channel 9 Sydney were the, you know, the bomb of TV journalism. So walking into this room, young New Zealand female, uh, where's my desk, where's the loo, filed two stories that day, that first day, and, and just sort of made it up as I went along. I just cr created it. You learn to beg, borrow and steal. You do have the finely tuned attributes of a thief. You learned, because of course my deadline was 3.30 in the afternoon Australia time, so you, you, you compress things. You're forever grabbing a bit of this tape. You're, you're chatting to that reporter, that cameraman. Can I have a bit of a, that grab or a bit of that? So you are putting all that stuff together. And that was a really, um, that was a really exciting time. It was a really interesting time in Australia. Um, the Bjorki Pedersen was the Premier of uh, Queensland and there were a lot of inquiries going on at the time, so I got to cover a lot of that. The politics, Bob Hawke was Prime Minister, and I learned as a young blonde that you could stop him because he'd like to give you a kiss on the cheek and then you'd get your quote off him. He was a devil. It was, that was the way Australian politics worked. So I used it and stopped him and got my kiss on the cheek and got my grab. So it was, um, there was lots of stories I got to do. You, you cover the whole gambit. Um, when you're Australia correspondent because it's just such a big country. The great thing about it though is, tran was, is translating for a New Zealand audience what's happening in Australia because whilst we are so close and we think we're similar, we're also quite different as countries. I had done, to that point, one piece of live TV and that one piece of live TV was a live cross into the home show about John Howard. So I went from doing one live cross, which was probably three or four minutes, to doing a whole half hour current affairs show. The terror, I'm surprised it didn't show on my face. My heart was there, the whole program. I'm surprised I could get a word out. I was so terrified. Somehow I got the words out. Somehow I did, I think, two interviews live that night. And somehow they thought it was okay and I just kept on filling in for Paul. What I didn't realise, because I was based in Australia still for the next year, was just what a big deal that show was and just what a change it had made to New Zealanders. And so I would wander back to Australia and no one would recognise me and that was fabulous, I still had my life. But then as soon as I got back here, suddenly it was like, oh, you're that, that woman off the home show. And it was like, oh, oh. you know, people recognised me. It was quite strange. They decided that they would uh, do a midday news hour because it was because Sean Brown always had a dream of a 24-hour news on TV One. So he set up this tiny little team in the middle of the newsroom, and we got on like a house on fire. We were just one of those high-performing teams. We. I still have the utmost respect and admiration for those women. They were just fantastic to work with. We turned out an hour of news every day. There would be five, six interviews, which I had to wrap my head around, and then as well as the unpronounceable Czech tennis player's name because you were reading sports news as well. So it was just, it was absolutely full on. And we were a tiny team, but we just, it just gelled and it worked. And that was a programme, I mean, it's no longer an hour, but that was a programme I was really proud of because it was, it was a really good quality program. It, you know, if, if you didn't watch anything else, you, you had the day in that hour. Mike Hosking and I were the first team, and it's so clear still the memories of those first few weeks. We had a, there's two and a half hours of live television. No, nobody was doing it, it hadn't been done here. Um, so we did five rehearsal days. We, did, we ran a week through as if it was as live. Well, that first rehearsal week, <gasps> It was a nightmare. We, we did not get through a whole show without stops and starts and, and you know, they were supposed to be as live. It was just a mess. So we had a fairly anxious weekend, all of us, and I'll never forget being in the newsroom on the Monday morning, the real deal. We, we just had to do it. You know, we just had to get the, sh the show out. And um, we're all frantically, you know, typing away and you could, the tension was palpable. You could feel it. And Johnny Graham, who was running the newsroom at that time, just came in and went, this is about 4.30 in the morning. All right, everybody, group hug. And we all looked up and there was a moment of we thought, are you mad? And then we all laughed and it broke the tension. Um, and we did a great first show. It was, it was probably not perfect, but it was clean enough. It went to air. We didn't have to stop and say, sorry, you know, sorry viewers, we, we stopped the tally, we can't do this. So it was, um, and then it went on from there. And I mean, that's what, 10 plus years now. And it's grown and grown and grown. And, and, and I'm proud of that, actually, proud to have been involved with that. Angela was not well, and so we devoted the whole program Today Live to her. And it was something I'm really proud of. It was magnificent. She was magnificent. Um, it was just a beautiful thing to 
give her that voice as well. We gave her the whole half hour, which is, you know, 22 minutes, and want to take the ads off. And to give her that and to give her that respect, I thought was really great. And what was also magnificent, Paul Holmes, who'd had his own battle with prostate cancer, popped up in the middle of it on air and, and, and kind of wandered in uh, to the studio. And it was just so lovely. And I'll never forget, he, 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 he was holding a hand. And he said, it's the nights, isn't it? It's that, you know, middle of the night when you wake up, they're the worst times, aren't they? And she went, yes, yes, you know, that four in the morning, it's the darkest time. And he said, turn the light on. Turn the light on, Angela. And I got a call from Pip Keane, who was the producer of Homes. Uh, where are you? I said, oh, I'm, I'm up Mount Royal Payu, actually. Uh, well, you better get in the car and drive, because Paul's announced he's going to Prime, and you're on air tonight. And it was like, right. So I drove back probably too fast and turned up and thinking all sorts of thoughts about, oh my God, went into the office, saw Paul, um, it was quite emotional really, and sat and did, and that night the program was called Close Up. They turned some titles around. I remember Ralston ringing me and saying, right, think of a name for the program, but it's not Wood. <laughs> and so it ended up being Close Up, which was not my name, that was someone else's, and it was just a huge thing, you know, it was this media firestorm, and I, and I sat, you know, sat through the few weeks, and then when, the, then when there was a bit of presenter idlers who would get it, and a lot of speculation, and, and then I got it. We then went into this really competitive environment, which was obvious, a country of four million people, there was not going to be room for three programmes, um, and, you know, it was, it was, Campbell Live came along and, and, and Close Up as the incumbent, and everybody wrote Close Up off, off, which was insane, um, and Paul's show. But of course Paul's show uh, didn't make it, and I remember being really sad that night actually. I felt a bit tearful because I know how much heart and energy you put into these things. Um, but it was a great battle for a few months, and it's certainly competition is good for business. It certainly made you think about what you were doing, um, the stories you were telling. I mean, it was it was um, it was sort of ex exhilarating and frightening and all those good things at once. I was told by the bosses, "Love your work, but we're going to cut your pay by 22%." This came off the back of you know Richard was gone, Judy treated abysmally in my view, and just just a whole lot of things and people I really regard highly not treated well by an organisation that I don't think was behaving well at the time. And I'm a stubborn little strop and I thought, no bugger you, you're not actually going to do that to me because it's not lawful. It was really a statement of, I've put 20 years in here, it's not about the dollar value. It would have played out differently in New Zealand if it was 45000 not 450 because it was such a large sum of money people didn't get the principle behind it. Um, I had intended to make my statement win and wander off, but what happened was the, the legal bills were a hundred grand or something. It was massive. It cost me enormously. The other part of that that I don't think anybody knows is that before it all got made public, I got a call from the Dominion Post political editor saying, hi Susan, uh, we know you're earning this and we know that there's a court case going on. So it had leaked out of Wellington. There were two places that could have come out of, in my view, the board or the government. And at that time I thought, I sat there and I thought, hell, I'm fighting City Hall, this is, wow. So the whole thing got this massive life of its own. Um, it was absolutely hideous to live through and not something I'd ever want to go through again. But, uh, you know, it's, it was an interesting side of the media, experiencing the other side of it. And looking back, am I glad I stood up for myself and what I thought was right? Yep.